Our opening prayer is coming from the Valley of Vision. Uh, Love to Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, if I love thee, my soul shall seek thee. But can I seek thee unless my love to thee is kept alive to this end? Do I love thee because thou art good and canst alone do me good? It is fitting that thou should not regard me, for I am vile and selfish. Yet I seek thee, and when I find thee, there is no wrath to devour me, but only sweet love. Thou dost stand as a rock between the scorching sun and my soul, and I live under the cool lee side as one elect. When my mind acts without thee, it spins nothing but deceit and delusion. When my affections act without thee, nothing is seen but dead works. Oh, how I need thee to abide in me, for I have no natural eyes to see thee. But I live by faith in one whose face to me is brighter than a thousand suns. When I see that all sin is in me, all shame belongs to me. Let me know that all good is in thee, and all glory is thine. Keep me from the error of thinking thou dost appear gloriously when some strange light fills my heart, as if that were the glorious activity of grace. But let me see that the truest revelation of thyself is when thou dost eclipse all my personal glory and all the honor and pleasure and good of this world. The sun breaks out in glory when he shows himself as the one who outshines all creation, making people poor in spirit and helping us to find their good in him alone. Grant that I may distrust myself to see my all is in thee. We pray this blessing, Father, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our friend, and our shepherd. Amen. Okay, we are ending Job today. I don't know. We were asking that question before. We'll look, I'll look at the lesson number one. It has the date on it when I get to my office. I need to recount. Uh, about a month ago, I counted how many studies we've done, and I think we've done 15 books of the Bible. We're starting Matthew in a couple weeks. Next week, I, I think I'm going to be reading a little book I wrote uh, as a way to explain and express the story of God through the Bible. Um, then we'll pick up on Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. But today we end with Job. May the reading of God's word be blessed by him. May it be heard as he intends it and understood as he wills. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Timonite, I am angry with you and your two friends. Because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite 
did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Kaziah, and the third Karen Hapak. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation, and so he died old and full of years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we start with Job's statements after four chapters of God speaking boldly over him. Job begins by saying, I know that you can do all things and that no plan of yours can be thwarted. So those are two statements made with his first breath after being overcome by a whirlwind of God's righteousness. The first thing is nothing shall be impossible for God. We hear that through both Testaments. Nothing shall be impossible for God. God can do all things really means two things. Number one is that God is able to do all things. Um, Who then can be saved? Ask Peter to Jesus. It's easier for a rich man to go through, or a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Who can be saved? And Jesus said to Peter, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Uh, Mary, the virgin, asked, how, how could this be? I have not been with a man. With, all, with God all things are possible. Uh, Sarah laughed. I think the name Isaac means uh, laughter. She laughed because it was impossible. The resurrection. It's, it's impossible. Not just resuscitation. What happened to Lazarus is impossible. Only with Christ. But the resurrection is truly impossible because it's a miracle. It's a new creation for one body to disappear and another to be there. The work of God, the story of God, is all about the miraculous. There's been a lot of energy put into making the Bible and the Christian faith reasonable. Uh, The disciples of Christ, the denomination, tends to attract people who challenge that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ken Davis uh, mentioned when I first met him that we disciples struggle with the inexplicable. We can't explain it. We don't like it. There was a movement that went around our country in the early 1900s trying to explain away all of the miracles, that the miracles were Uh, basically uh, uh, symbolic and weren't literal. Uh, For instance, uh, when Jesus fed the 5,000, he uh, began to share, and everybody else saw that Jesus was sharing, and so he started to share, they started to share, she started to share, and everyone shared, and it turned out we all had plenty if we would just share. Well, it's a nice moral of the story. If the Bible was written like the tortoise and the hare, that slow and steady wins the race, keep working, don't give up, and good things will happen. But the Bible is not a bunch of fables. The Bible is about the grace of God providing in a world of impossibilities what only could be possible with God. So up front, we see from Job, if you're truly of the faith, that you're dealing with and in covenant with a God who can do all things. 
Jesus did walk on the water. Jesus did descend into Hades. And Jesus did resurrect on the third day by the power of God. Jesus will return with glory. Jesus does uh, and has the ability to forgive all sins and to multiply his own body like that bread and fish to as many people as will receive him. Jesus is able to do what man cannot do. So not only can God do anything, the second I've written here, plus God, uh, God's allowed to do whatever he deems righteous. And that sounds laughable that we would use the word allowed with God, <clears throat> But that's the word that we have to use nowadays because people will say, I will not believe in a God who, or I cannot believe in a God who, or how dare God do this, that, or the other. But God not only can physically, but can in terms of what's right and wrong, justly do whatever he determines is right. By definition, whatever God does is good. God can flood the whole world and kill every living creature except two by two and one family. Jesus, our Lord, could have picked up that stone and killed that adulterous woman. Let the one who has no sin cast the first stone. That sounds like good news till you realize Jesus is standing there. Great. What are the odds? First time I get caught in adultery, the only person in the whole world that has no sin is standing there. That's just like me, isn't it? I mess up one time and then I get caught. Jesus could have killed that woman. He didn't. He gave her mercy. God can uh, uh, take the firstborn of Egypt. God can remove his temporary grace and take out all of Sodom and Gomorrah and even turn Lot's wife into salt. God can kill his son on a tree if he determines that that's what's right to do. It doesn't mean that these things are easy for God to do. It doesn't mean that he finds some sort of sadistic pleasure in people being uh, suffering. Even when we say it pleased the Lord to crush his son, what we do not mean is that God got some sort of kick out of Jesus, his only begotten, dying for the sins of his church. But rather... The will of God was that his son take on the curse of God, hang on a tree for a greater gain. It was difficult, but it was good. That's why we call the worst day in the history of the world Good Friday. You can do all things. Preach that in your heart to God. You can do all things and mean it. You can do all things, God. You're able. And just because everybody on the planet would shake their fist at you for doing whatever you determined to do, you can do all things. You can do whatever you see as fit. And if we have a disagreement, God, I'm the wrong one. The next thing Job says is no plan of God's can be thwarted. Thwarted is most often translated fortified. So you're thinking almost always when that word is used, it's from the, it's from the perspective of the uh, defensive position. Um, God is my fortress and my shield. A mighty fortress is our God. Uh, we will build up the city walls and we will be fortified. So when the Assyrians or the Babylonians come, we will be ready. We've got uh, weapons. We've got the Lord, but we've also got these walls, these impenetrable walls. And don't, I guess we'll just forget about what happened in Jericho, but these walls will stand. So fortified is normally used by the people building the walls, but in this case, it's used from the person the walls are built against. No plan of God's can be stopped through any form of fortification. God's purposes are inevitable. They cannot be slowed or prevented by the efforts of creation, whether that is man-made or hell. God's plans cannot be stopped. So those are the two things Job, he is, you like roller coasters? 
Did you used to like roller coasters at least? You know that first drop? The scariest thing about that first drop is you can't breathe. <laughs> you, you, you know, well, Job's been in that position for four chapters. <gasps> and here he is, and the first words that come out is, <laughs> you can do anything you want, and no one can stop you. St. Paul describes this phenomenon in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you'll flip with me there. about the God who demolishes strongholds. And again, these strongholds he's demolishing are the very ones that are built against him by man or by hell to prevent the plans of God, the purposes of God. Paul says in verse 3, 2 Corinthians 10, beginning with verse 3, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient unto Christ. Paul is writing as an apostle ordained by God. About half the New Testament would come through him, along with Peter and James and the gospel writers. They were authorized to pen the scriptures so that God would use the power of Holy Scripture in every generation to continue to overthrow a certain form of stronghold against God's plans, and that is our cerebral stronghold, the conditions of the heart and the false logics of the mind. So by the time somebody is targeted with God's grace, they've already built up calluses and arguments and reasons and excuses not to trust in God. And the Bible, according to St. Paul, both when he was ministering and penning these words, is designed to take apart that wall. Because God's not just content with tearing down walls to prove that he can tear down walls, but he loves the people hidden behind them. He loves us. And so the Bible is written in one way to say, God is here to demolish all of the ways I have built a barrier to control my life even against God's righteous will. So just chew on that for a moment, that we build walls because we don't know what to do with a love like this and because we don't know what to do with a world like that. And we feel safer that way. And Christ comes to demolish those walls because he loves us. So that's Job's first statement. I couldn't stop this, I couldn't prevent this, and whatever you've chosen to do is good. Now, verse 3, Job says, You asked, who is this that obscures my knowledge, my counsel without knowledge? And then Job confesses, Surely I spoke of what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. So Job confesses that even though he is covenanted, he is saved, that he is imperfect at waiting. And there's some good news for all of us. God's wrath does not rest upon those who are imperfect. It rests upon those who do not receive his son, Jesus Christ. You'll look back on any period of your life that was stressful or tense, and you'll find some things you could have done better. And that doesn't change the basic narrative or structure of the story. If you're in the gospel, if you're in the blood, if you're in the book of life, even in your imperfect waiting, God is right there. And so Job confesses, as we should all confess, it's good to confess your sins to God, to say, I I apologize, God, that I didn't trust you as much as I I was able to trust you. I'm I'm sorry I didn't, um, I'm sorry I, I, I used my freedom to, to lash out or to complain 
uh, or to be mean to the nurse or to, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, God. I, I didn't wait perfectly. In some cases, you can say, I didn't wait well at all. Most of the Catholic Church has taught for years that uh, the Christian life is a holy vigil. Our, our whole life uh, is waiting. In fact, if you'll open up your hymnal to, uh, let me look up the, it's 261, no, 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 570, 570. Notice the words, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. The joys I feel, the bliss I share of those whose anxious spirits burn with strong desires for thy return. With such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face and gladly take my station there and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. Now notice the sweet hour of prayer is not what he's waiting for. He's using the sweet hour of prayer as an action of waiting for his return, his relief, his spirit, your death, your healing, whatever God's going to give you, or the actual physical return of Jesus. The last verse says, Thy wings shall my petition bear. Thy wings my petition bears. To him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting of soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust his grace, I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee sweet hour of prayer. The church is called to wait. Job was written so we could learn. In your own life and my life and all the challenges we'll face is all built upon the truth and rock of Christ and the grace that all things are going to be perfect in the end. And so we learn how to ride that roller coaster and we learn how to, how to, to, to experience the path of life that God's laid before us. But we do need to confess repeatedly, assuming we're in the covenant, we need to confess that though we're saved by grace, that we don't always wait well. One of the challenges Job gives us is to grow in that direction, to be better. And the only way you'll be better at waiting is with time with Christ. To be full of the Holy Spirit, to see what's happening, and to know that indeed you can do it. You can wait. Job, it's a lot like Isaiah 40. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. So you also look at verse 5. So he's confessed. He says, I've not not been the best waiter. But then you get to verse 5, and I I love this. He says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Um, so again, Job is in the tractor beam. At the beginning this Sunday, we're starting a, a series on evangelism, on the, the economy of God, the, the way he, God has provided a gate in the world, and anyone who knocks, all whosoever, whoever knocks on the gate, that gate shall open, and they are permitted to walk down the path. Once they come through the first gate, you're guaranteed to make it through the pearly gates at the end. But there's a lot of confusion about whether a person is actually through the gate or if you've just camped, camped out your whole life and studied the gate, and talked about the gate, and never knocked. Now, that's not Job, but Job shows the progression. There has to be a progression. And so the first thing is that we see for most of his life, if you read chapter 1, that Job was living in uh, reverence to God. He believed in God on faith alone. He heard the testimony 
of the Lord, and, and he had uh, believed. So I've written that he had heard of the Lord, he had gotten to know some things about the Lord, and acted in faith as if it's all true, being fully convinced. That's faith. According to Romans, that's the definition of faith, being fully persuaded that what God promised to do, God would do. So in some case, faith has to have a cerebral element. You need to know. You need to have the information upon which you can have faith. But that's not where God wants to leave us. As the hunger builds in our lives, that faith is determined and decidedly uh, by, the, by the Spirit's plans to become a very strong reality in every Christian's life. A couple years ago, we had Doug Skinner in town to, to teach a, les- a couple lessons on uh, communion. And he told the story about the difference between uh, truth and reality. Um, imagine you're, you're walking down a path with one of your, with your father with, or your mom and and you know they love you, and, and you've heard them say that they love you, and you're walking along them, and next to them. But then at some point, your parent stops and gets down on one knee and takes you in her or his arms and kisses you on the cheek and says, I love you. And then sets you down and you walk some more. That's what it is to experience something that's true being real. truth is the truth, and by God's grace, God loves to show up and make what's true real. This is what Job's talking about. He had saving faith in a righteous God who was merciful against his sin and could atone for them. But now through this experience, God has elected not only to allow the devil to have access to this man temporarily, but that this man at the end of this time would receive a very real expression of what's true. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. So I've added here, but. But now what is true has become real for me. I have seen God. I put seen in quotes because I don't think uh, the, the point of Job was that Job was able to actually look at God's face and see the contour because we know scripturally that's kind of a difficult thing to do. But he's, he experienced, he saw with, the, with his whole being more of God than he had ever seen before. I've written also, by the way, a, a person does not have to see the Lord through suffering alone. You can ask and you can plead for the Lord to reveal his son to you. This morning I was in here praying and got hit with this uh, truth that God will uh, accept all people as we are who accept God as he is. He'll accept anybody as you are as long as you accept him as he is. And the only way to accept him as he is is through Jesus Christ our Lord. For Jesus is the exact imprint of God. If you've known Christ, you know the Father. There's, that's how you... It's almost like uh, these praise songs, uh, I want to see you, I want to know your face, I want to... And all these kind of modern praise songs. I'm not against them, but just it's real personal praise songs. And it's, it's funny because I think some people sing those songs, and let's, let's say, uh, for, for the sake of argument, I'm God, please don't say that very often, but you're singing to me, I want to see your face, and God's holding past your song, Jesus Christ. And you keep going around Jesus, praying to the Father. I want to see, I want to know you, I want to smell you, I want to experience your touch, I want to, I want to worship you, I want to ex- know your glory. I want, and, and God's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. You're here and you're, you're skipping Jesus. Go to Jesus. There is no other way. There is no other mediator between mankind and God than the man Jesus Christ. He is the exact representation of the Father. When you have the Father's blessing where he reveals his Son to the eyes of your heart, whether it's when you're awake or you're dreaming or you're studying the Bible or you're having a transcendent moment of worship, that experience is a grace moment to you when what's true becomes real. I've added here, it will answer 10,000 questions we didn't know we had. I have heard of you, 
but now I have seen you. And then he goes on in verse 6, Therefore I despise myself, repent, in dust and ashes. Encounters with God demolish any form of self-righteousness we have. Literally, this translates, I reject myself. To, to put dust and ashes on something is to put it in the trash heap. Like it, This deserves to be buried. I'm not proud of myself. I'm not proud of my own level of righteousness. Now, again, if, <clears throat> if we didn't have Jesus and we just compared ourselves to each other, then we can play that game. I remember before uh, youth group one night, when I was a youth pastor, we were all playing basketball. I had a real ath- kind of athletic uh, youth ministry, and uh, uh, we were seeing who could dunk and who could touch the rim and who, all this stuff. And uh, one of our youth sponsors said, isn't, I, isn't it ironic that we are judging who can jump the best in the presence of the one who can touch the stars? Encounters with God demolishes any form of self-righteousness. As we prayed from the, the Valley of Vision, there's that one line. The sun breaks out in glory when he outshines all of creation. The presence of the glory of Jesus is not here to enhance the world or to uh, brighten the world in and of itself, but in some cases show how truly dark the world is, how unholy we are apart from him. We normally preach this text on Ash Wednesday. It's the beginning of the walk. When you experience the truth of God through Jesus Christ, that also highlights your own bankruptcy, your own spiritual weakness. I've written down here that Job has received what no worldly comfort or wealth could give him, the inner treasure of seeing God. The assurance of salvation, the maturity of the soul, the blessing and pleasure of God. Now we're going to study it in a minute, but just flash forward to when he's restored. And on the surface, all these people are like, aren't you, aren't you so glad that, you know, you got your money back, you got your health back, you got your life back. And, and they're all kind of, maybe not, but I think several people would be judging uh, the story of, of Job a little different. And they can't see what's taken place inside of him and the level of his, his, uh, his peace and his inner strength and his assurance that if God had not restored his fortunes, it's, just, it, it's not that it doesn't matter, it's just that that's not the true treasure. And he has a peace that no one can steal and an assurance that is rock solid. Verses 7 through 9, God is angry with Job's three original friends. He, he lets off the, the, the young one, um, I've written that though Job was imperfect in his waiting, uh, it should be he, he is in the book of life and has an imperfect understanding of a perfect God. That's Job. He is in the book. He's in the covenant. He uh, is not perfect at waiting, and his doctrine is not perfect, but he has an imperfect doctrine regarding the perfect God. In the words of Tim Keller, It is not the amount of faith that saves a person, but the object of their faith that saves them. So it's not the amount, but it's the object that saves a person. So Job has now an even more maturing. As St. Paul says, through the Holy Ghost, we are transformed from one degree of glory into the next. So now he's continuing to grow by God's grace and progress down the pilgrim's path as he comes closer to the perfect God, Yahweh, our Father, even though he himself is imperfect. That's Job. Now, Job's friends must repent completely. We can all but assume that Job's friends are the folks who have plenty of words, but their hearts are far from God. They have perfect articulation of some God other than the Lord their God. It's best to have an imperfect understanding of a perfect God than a perfect understanding of an imperfect idol. The fact that what Job's friends make sense 
to the common man probably means it's an idol. God reveals himself to those who would receive his son Jesus, and God has proven that his wisdom is not the world's wisdom. In fact, he has thrown down the world's wisdom. The things he has to say are counter to what we would have assumed, what we would have wanted, what we would have thought. It's better. So Job's friends are, in all of their doctrine for all these chapters, reveal, and now God can see their heart. He can see Job's heart. He knows what's going on, but his concern is not just for Job. He has a concern and a love for Job's friends. This is grace. What happens here is not wrath, and what happens here is not um, uh, neglect or petulance or, aha, you're wrong. It's love. Because what he tells, he convicts these men, is that you're so far from where you think you should be. You are so off. You are, you are professional uh, idolaters. Repent. Repent. Well, I used to play basketball uh, when I was a kid at church with Andy Mangum, our current regional minister. Uh, he had gotten kind of slow and heavy, so you could, you could shoot over him anytime you wanted. So he, because he couldn't block your shot, he would just yell, repent, <laughs> every time you shot. And uh, in this, I mean, re- repent's kind of a funny word because it comes, if you're not churched, it comes loaded with negative imagery. Uh, uh, guilt-based repentance, not joy-based repentance. But this is God's grace to these three men. Uh, They must sacrifice and they must repent. There must be atonement and they they must uh, enter through the gate. All men must come through the gate. No matter how good or developed you think you are, you cannot crawl over the wall you, don't, you can't transfer your credit from your high school to your college and get, you know, a leg up. No, you, you have to start over. That's why the Pharisees hated Jesus the most, because he said, nope, you're all the same. Job is authorized to pray for their forgiveness and to pray for God's blessing to them. Another sign of mercy and maturity is to, is to be ready and eager to bless those who were kind of a pain before. This Sunday we had a whole lesson on blessing your enemies. I was talking with a group of guys yesterday about um, God's ways, and um, one of the things we see in blessing of enemies, especially if it's a, if it's a real uh, like a prominent person with a lot of articulation and intelligence, and they seem to be doing things that are counter to the people of God, counter to the scriptures. Um, one of the things God can choose to do and has chosen to do is to steal that person for his team. Um, what, what would you say if, if three years ago uh, A&M uh, went and did some sort of voodoo and just let it be known to Texas Tech that we now have Patrick Mahomes? You can't do that. Just did. He's ours now. The weapons of war for the people of God include blessing our enemies. You know, we don't tend to get frustrated at people who are quiet and idiotic. We get frustrated at people who are smart and talented and are using their smarts and talents for the wrong things. That's why we bless and we pray. Job could have been restored and said, see ya to his three friends. But these extremely articulate, intelligent, well-versed, well-planned, committed men on the wrong side are brought in. Would you bless your enemies? Would you continue continue to pray? Because this is one, there's a war on right now. Are we not going to, are we only going to, Use foot troops? We're not going to... Air Force? No? None? Navy? No? No? Okay. We have so much at our disposal. We have so many grace-based weapons, that's the word Paul uses, for this war. Now, here's the moral. 
with Job's friends. It's not just how fast you travel, but the direction matters too. I'd rather go five miles an hour in the right direction than a hundred in the wrong. And so God's grace to this person and God's grace to anybody um, who is of a false religion is, is to cause them to hit the brakes, repent, and learn to pick up speed in the right direction through the narrow gate. Now here's a note I've written on the bottom here. Now note this. Because next it's going to say Job prayed for his friends and the Lord made him prosperous again. But first, Job was in the same state of physical suffering and grief when he, number one, experienced the Lord in a very real way. Boils, grief, finances, pain. He had no promise from God that he would be restored. He wasn't saying, okay, I'm about to be restored. Now I'm happy. It wasn't anticipatory. It was he had found God. He experienced the grace of God in a deeper level that was greater. That's when we say, and may the peace of Christ, which transcends, which all understanding, the peace that doesn't make sense, may you have that kind of peace. It's not when your life is easy. It's when even when your life's not easy, you have an inner shalom, an inner strength. So he, he's He's still hurting, and he has this experience with God. And number two, in the same suffering experience, he prayed for his friends and oversaw their repentance. You're at the hospital, you're on a ventilator, you can barely move, and you have waited imperfectly, but waited. You're in the book of life, and you've got three jack wagon friends, and then God's working on their life, and God sends them to your room while they repent before God, and you can't even talk, and you in your heart pray for these three, and they come unto Christ, and you are rejoicing and ready. If you died today, no problem, no questions, no complaints, you're good. The point of Job is not that he was rich and then God made him rich again. The point of Job is that he's a sinner saved by grace and God gave him more and more grace throughout the path. That's the story. Then you turn to verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters And everyone who had known him came and ate with him in their house. Verse 10, I've written that the Lord redeemed Job. Redeemed means making something better than it started. It's good, then hurt, and then repaired twice as strong. Did you know that's what redeemed means? When you break a leg, the hope is you can get it back to where it was. Redeemed means the leg is ten times as strong as it started. That's why only God can take what's perfect and make it better. Only God can take this first creation, when he says it's good, it is very good, awesome, and then let it fall into disrepair and into rebellion and into sin and redeem it through the, through the powerful blood of his son, Jesus, and it's ten times better than perfect. We need to preach redemption more, I think. How is God redeeming you? What has God allowed to befall you? That's why we know by faith the last shall be first, the first shall be last. Those who have had the most breaks and bruises and gotten messed over and unjustly hurt or life, all the stuff, bumps them in the line because those are more places where God's redeeming grace is going to shine. I cannot wait to see the glory of a baby from the book of life that didn't get to live a second outside the womb. Can you imagine? You think your life's hard? Imagine never drawing breath and yet living and now living. That's who, who can do this? I now know that nothing is impossible with you. 
and you can do all things. The Lord redeemed Job. Now, there's something in verse 11 that's my belief. I'm going to speak it to you and you can test it. But notice his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him came and ate with him. They comforted and consoled him and all the trouble that God had brought upon him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. Pieces of silver aren't used very often in the Bible. Where do we hear of them? Redeeming slaves or Jesus. There was an exchange of silver with Judas. The very phrase, pieces, 30 pieces of silver. I believe that Job is many things, but above all, that he, this is a Christological book. That Jesus Christ is the better Job. He started great. He humbled himself, suffered, attacked by the devil, all the way to death. God also highly exalted him, giving him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And because of Jesus, he is able to bring many sons and daughters to glory. Now, Job was a real person, a historical figure, just as David is a historical figure, but Jesus is the better David. Jesus is the better Noah. He is the better Moses. He's the better Abraham. He's the better Adam. The whole Bible is about Jesus. The Old Testament predicts him. The Gospels reveal him. The, The Acts preach him. The Epistles explain him. And the book of Revelation expects him. It's all about Jesus. Jesus experienced worse than Job and fell farther than Job. And likewise, he's been exalted higher than Job. Jesus was thrown in a pit just as Joseph was and sold into slavery and now sits on the mercy seat to give forgiveness to all who come. This means that the reason this parabolic work of Job's life, God's grace to Job, to wait in perfectly and we're forgiven for that and still included. It all works because Jesus, our Savior, wait, he actually waited and fulfilled and did all the Job things without mumbling or grumbling. Why are you so good to me, God? Because Jesus Christ has done what we couldn't and wouldn't do. Nothing in the Bible is fulfilled or makes sense or is turned on and running unless Jesus our Lord came in the flesh, lived the life, died on the cross, was raised and ascended and at the right hand. For in Christ, all of God's promises are yes and amen. I love how God slipped this in here so that though we can see so much about Job and the character of God the Father, he slips in so that we can't get away without remembering Jesus. Jesus was in Job when he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. If there is only one who could put his hand on me and his hand on God and mediate between us, and here at the end, even at the moment of redemption, God gives us clues if we'll see see them of the true Job, the better Job, That's why Calvary and the life of Christ, we're moving to Matthew next, is the most important story because all of these are just uh, echoes and foreshadows of what God chose to do through Christ. Now we see verses 12 through 17 that the latter is better than the former. Once again, God can take what's perfect and make it better. He has wealth. He has 10 descendants. Now, I think this is interesting. The daughters are named, but the sons are not. The daughters are named, but the sons are not. One of them is Jemima. 
what are the odds of that? that we're, on the one time Jemima's in the Bible and the world's going crazy over Jemima. God's daughters, Job's daughters are named. Um, and, and also get this, um, they're included in the inheritance. We know in Galatians there is no longer male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, but all one in Christ. In, in almost every culture, especially back then, only the eldest son got the, the inheritance. And, and maybe in a sign of great grace, the younger brother too, a little, 10%. But to include the women? This would have jumped off the page to the earliest readers of Job. The gospel of God is to create a people that come unto Christ. Even with our little piece of silver, our own sign that we were the one who betrayed him. Just like Job's, uh, Joseph's brothers had to come for him for mercy. It was us. And what Christ doesn't do is hold our sin against us. If you'll come to him, like Job's friends and family and brothers and sisters, and comfort and console him over all the trouble brought upon him and to give him the proper adoration he deserves. But we live in a world right now where it is insane that I have to tell somebody that Jesus Christ deserves their affections. The preaching of the church, the preaching of the gospel is to remove the insanity of the heart, the hard-hearted mind of mankind that is somehow capable of standing before the king of glory whose son is more radiant than a, face is more radiant than a thousand suns and have to tell them, now worship him. Adore him. Wipe your tears on his feet. Give him your silver. Sell all you have to follow him. The gospel, the work, the story, it cannot be overpreached. As we conclude with Job today, we're going to have a moment of prayer. And I ask that we use that to think of our own hearts, our own position in Christ, the calling we all have to be faithful waiters, even if we come to God imperfectly, to be okay to bless and pray for those who come our way that are of no help. But while we're doing all this, to cast our eyes the whole time on Jesus, the better Job, the one who suffered and died and was completely afflicted and now lives and reigns. This story, this gospel is the evergreen of history. It will not change, it will not fade, and if it doesn't get someone excited, that's on them. Our life is depending upon what our heart will do in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. The better Job, the one who lives completely restored and redeemed to bless all who come. Let's pray.
fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O thou of God, to earth come down. Thee will I cherish. Thee will I honor. Thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fairer still the woodlands, robed in the blooming garb of spring. Jesus is fairer, Jesus is purer, who makes the woeful heart to sing. Fair is the sunshine, fairer still the moonlight, and all the twinkling starry hosts. Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines purer, than all the angels heaven can boast. We adore you, O Christ, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of man. And we thank you for your perfect demeanor and glory and work. Set our hearts upon you. Redeem us in every way. And may we be of the many that you are bringing into glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior and friend. Amen.